The fifth and final leadership imperative is that the leader needs to be someone who stabilizes the, the, um, the environment, so to say. A leader who can bring a presence of calm and confidence in the midst of the anxiety and fear that uh, we find in complexity and chaos is a leader that will be helping his or her people to transverse the whole issue of um, complexity in our environment. A writer has said something, says all of the great leaders have had one characteristic in common. It was a willingness to confront unequivocally the major anxiety of their people in their time. This and not much else is the essence of leadership. If you are afraid, don't show it. If everybody is afraid and you come and say, well, I'm afraid too, then who are they going to draw strength from? Somebody says that courage is not the absence of fear, but it's moving on even in the midst of fear. So as a leader, we must tell them that it is okay, it is well. You may be shaking inside. I once listened to uh, the, one of the uh, well-renowned uh, uh, American general, General Powell, Colin Powell. He, said, he was saying something about his, his, his days as a commander, that when you're hungry you don't, and your troops are hungry, you don't tell them I'm hungry too. You find ways in which you can quench the hunger. And if you cannot, you encourage them to move on. And so you must show that. And so it is said that people easily sense what you are communicating. And it's called emotional contagion. It's a research area in which the emotions of one person is transferred to another person or group. And they spread from person to person. And automatically, we mimic the facial expression, the body language, the speech pattern and the vocal tones of others. And the emotions are spread for two main reasons. Number one, we are in, innately, innately hardwired to mimic what others are doing outwardly. And then secondly, when we mimic the outward display of others, we, we then unknowingly adopt their internal state. So as leaders, we must, in the place or state of complexity, learn to bring calm and confidence to the people we lead. By maintaining a calm presence, leaders can transform the anxiety of the organization. So uh, I've given you a framework in terms of five imperatives that we can, um, we can begin to display as leaders in the midst of, uh, of, of um, complexity. But let me now share with you another framework. And so there is a scholar who looked at the concept of VUCA and then he, he now introduced what is called VUCA Prime. VUCA Prime now kind of um, uses the same acronym uh, as VUCA, but it introduces what we as leaders can do uh, for each of the components of VUCA. So he says, for example, that uh, where there is volatility, leaders need to continue to articulate and communicate a vision of the future. So this is also another framework you can use. During volatility, it's our responsibility to communicate and paint a, a picture of the future, both as a compass for people so that they can know where they are going and also to give them meaning and to spark motivation. There's nothing as powerful as a vision that motivates people, even in the midst of, of trying circumstances. And so it helps to forge internal and external identity and effectiveness. The second component of the VUCA prime is understanding. So in the place of uncertainty, he says we should begin to understand the interconnections and make them transparent. I, I think this relates to one of, the, one of the imperatives that I've stated earlier on. We need to reflect on our various contexts. We need to think and plan. We need to start from what is the result that we expect and work backwards. We need to harmonize the skills of our people. We need to embrace and exploit the behaviors and reactions that we see. And we need to convert anxiety and resistance to produce energy. So understand what is going on and then uh, do something about it. The third uh, aspect of the VUCA world, which has to do with complexity, it says in the place of complexity, uh, bring about clarity. And so try to bring about simplicity, communicate simply, uh, focus on what really counts. Okay, one of, the, one of the things about complexity is that it shouts at us. It, it grips us so hard that we sometimes 
begin to focus on what is not important. Uh, those of us that have, that have read the time management matrix, this is that quadrant, quadrant three, where you begin to focus on what is urgent, but is not important. We must never be caught focusing on what is urgent. The fact that something is urgent and is staring you in the face doesn't mean that it is, it is important. A few days ago, I was in the bathroom and I brought my phone and I put it on the sink. And just as I was taking my shower, the phone started to ring. And I said clearly to myself, you are a temptation. I'm not going to answer you. I may try to just answer that phone and I could sleep. And there are so many people who have slept in the bathroom because they tried to answer a ringing phone. So I had to consciously speak to myself and speak to the phone and remind myself that there is what is called missed call facility. And, and after I, I finished my bath, I looked at it and it was not such an important call at the end of the day. So we must learn to focus on what is truly important and help our people to focus on what is important. We must build trust. We must build transparent connections and processes. We must apply energy and force exactly where they'll be most effective. And so we must use the lever uh, of, of uh, leadership to, to place where we will get the most results and not get, not get pushed around by the complex forces in the VOCA world. And the last act, part of the acronym is in the place of ambiguity, we must learn agility. We must learn to, and agility is all about flexibility. It's about um, uh, helping to make decisions in a, in a manner that uh, may not necessarily be devoid of mistakes, but where mistakes become opportunities to learn. There's a concept of failing forward or failing fast. Okay, you fail, but failure does not become uh, the issue. But what have you learned from that failure and how have you uh, put that learning into the next uh, uh, piece of work that you will do? so that it improves. We must learn to interact and help our people interact in a transparent manner uh, uh, with objections when they bring it up and facilitate innovation and build resilience. So agility and all these help to build resilience. Uh, there is another framework that I would have shared with you, but uh, you can go ahead and look at that, look that up. It's called the Stockdale Paradox. And that's the fact that I stopped deal. And it comes from, again, a military background. It was a military uh, officer who was imprisoned in, in the Nazi camp and how he was able to survive. The stock deal uh, paradox says that we must never be people that are fatalistic. That is, we must not look at the worst case scenario only. We must look at what's the best case. So where is our faith? But in, in, in hanging on to faith, we must also say, what is the best, what's the worst case scenario that can happen? And when you know the worst case scenario, you then go on. Somebody says, the way you deal with this is, what is the worst that can happen? Okay, this is the worst. And then moving on with your life in spite of that worst case scenario. So that's, that, that helps you to build what is called resilience, ability to stand and bounce back in the face of adversity. So that's, um, uh, the framework of Booker Prime that will help us to deal with the forces of complexity in a VUCA world. I'd like to share with you the final framework, uh, which is the five practices of exemplary leadership. I mentioned it earlier on. Uh, this is a leadership model that you can adopt, uh, which kind of puts together, and I like it, it puts together some of the issues we've discussed. And it's, it's the work of Kuz and Posner, uh, derived from previously the, the work that Tom Peters had done. And they've, they've done it so where they have assessments. They have what they call the, the leadership practices inventory, which is an assessment that assesses leaders on these five dimensions. I've used this very much uh, in my past consulting life where I've had to implement this with people. So the, I have about 15 minutes left and I'd just like to take that uh, with this. So the first part of the uh, five practices is that leaders challenge the process. And, and so what it says is that leaders thrive on and learn from adversity and difficult situation. We must be risk takers. Uh, we, we regard failure, which is not caused by poor performance. So we're not talking about failure coming from poor performance. 
As leaders, we must be very tolerant of poor performance. But failure that results from the fact that people tried, they did their best, that, you know, they, they failed. We must learn to engage them and, 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 and find out what is it that they've learned and how can they innovate. And leaders are also early adopters. We seek out things that appear to work and then insist that they are improved. What we're experiencing today in, in, the, in the aftermath of this pandemic is that people are beginning to use the resources of collaboration, online collaboration to communicate. And the question is, are we going to drop this when this pandemic is over? There are so many meetings that we hold that are unnecessary. Are we going to begin to leverage on these for some of those meetings? I'm not saying that we should obliterate face-to-face -face meetings completely, but how well are we going to embrace this? Or are we going to say uh, it's gone so we don't need it? We must keep challenging the process, keep challenging our, ourselves, and keep challenging our paradigm. We must experiment. We must learn to take risks and encourage others to do so and create a culture in which people feel that they can learn even when they make mistakes. The second point is that leaders inspire a shared vision. The hallmark of leadership is the fact that we articulate, we communicate a shared vision. We are motivated uh, by, people are generally motivated by ideas that capture their, their imagination. Uh, but there are people that need some leaders motivated by fear or reward. But those are people that are only going to do the things that you need them to do for a while. But we know that there are people who go all out because of the of what you have painted, the vision you have painted for them, and um, they embrace it. It's about communicating it effectively so that people begin to own that vision. Leaders that are great are future-oriented, and they energize others by passion, by enthusiasm and emotion. Somebody has said that uh, sometimes people do things not because of the facts that you give them, but because of the emotion you generate in them. So as leaders, this is not about whether I'm introverted or whether I'm extroverted. We need to learn how to generate enthusiasm, how to generate passion in our people, whether we are businesses or whether we are, we are not, not for profit or we are church. How do we generate the passion to help people run with the sense of shared purpose that you have um, given them? And so we generate a vision that is uh, uplifting, that is ennobling, and uh, people can connect with. The third is the fact that leaders, great leaders, enable others to act. They don't seek to achieve it all by themselves. That's why we are leaders. If you are a leader and you are doing it all by yourself, you are not a leader. In some work, you are still, you are still a glorified, um, uh, you know, what I call a, a lower level uh, person in the sense that you are given five resources to work with you. And because you, you feel they will make mistakes, you do it yourself, the cumulative result that you could have obtained is no more there. Someone, someone, someone may say, why, why are we talking this at this level? It is because there are still leaders who feel that it is better they do it themselves than to waste them and give it to others and teach them. The time you spend in teaching others and, and, um, and um, helping them to learn the ropes is not time that is wasted. And so you achieve results through others as um, a leader and give them the space to act. Okay, share the goals with them build the trust between yourself and them and, and provide information that they would need to uh, succeed. The fourth is that leaders model the way. Leaders are prepared to go first. Leaders should leave the behaviors they want others to adopt before they ask them to adopt. It's not a question of do as I say and not as I do. So people will believe not what they hear their leaders say, but what they see their leaders consistently do. And great leaders should demonstrate the desired approach. And specifically, they should set example for others by behaving in ways that are consistent with the values that they have, the values of the organization. Uh, let's plant small wins, small things that can promote progress in the team and then build. The last uh, leadership practice is the fact that leaders encourage the heart. People act best when they are passionate about what they are doing. And so as leaders, we must find ways to unleash the enthusiasm of our people with stories and passions of, of our own. Um, a few days ago, I, 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 one of the things I enjoy most is some people that I've, I've led in the past, and we discuss the, the difficulties we passed, the times that, you know, uh, I had to issue them 
with difficult assignments and what they went through. And we, we share them, we laugh over them. And uh, we, we celebrate the goodness of God uh, for those successes. Well, of course, we acknowledge the failures and we, we also say what, what that did to us. So uh, we need to recognize the contribution of others and we need to seek and recognize the individuals and the contribution of specific teams to the success of every project. Don't take the glory alone as a leader, okay? They give you the glory, but spread the glory down to the rest of the team. Celebrate the team's accomplishment and look for engaging and novel ways to do so. So that's the framework of the five uh, practices of exemplary leadership by Kuz and Posner. I encourage you to go and look at it. I'd like to close uh, this session uh, before the question and answer with this with these thoughts um, is a quote that several people have, have leveraged on, uh, but it was popularized by Stephen Covey when he says that we see the world not as it is, but as we are. We see the world based on our paradigms. And our paradigms are influenced by our experience, by our upbringing, uh, by our education, by so many things. Uh, as the old adage says, that is only a man who has not, a boy who has not seen another person's father's farm that says that his father's farm is the largest. And so we see the world based on the glasses that we, we see through. And so if we are going to lead effectively in complex environment, we need to challenge what we see or how we see. Somebody says that if you want, if you want arithmetic progress, you can change your behavior, change what you do. But if you want quantum leap progress, then you need to change how you see things because how you see things affect your behavior. There is the, the secular uh, framework that Stephen Covey popularized. He says that what you see affects what you do and what you do affects the results that you get. If you want to change the results that you get, you do not focus on what you do. You focus on what you see, how you are seeing, and then how you are seeing the things in the new light will affect what you do. And then you will get new results. And so my closing thought for us is let's challenge the way we see things in the light of the complexities of our environment. So hopefully if we, if we see things differently, we will act differently and we'll become more effective leaders. Thank you for your time. Thank you very, very much, sir. Uh, maybe we can see your face now, please. <laughs> so, if all you right. can turn off. So, ladies and gentlemen, it's time for questions. Um, okay, I have a question here that says um, another question for Pastor Sunde. How do you apply all these principles in the church, in the church setting, where people expect their leaders to be gentle, kind, and accommodating, etc.? The church appears to be one of the most difficult places to lead. Workers, members, etc., tend to misunderstand and misinterpret the actions of their leaders, especially when they take a um, firm stand on issues or when they discipline. Did you get that, sir? Or should I read again? Well, yeah. So let me try and um, share my understanding. So, how do we? So, I think the, the person asking the question is uh, concerned with the, with the dilemma or paradox between uh, trying to be gentle and trying to be firm. Uh, yes. Trying to, uh, to be, as they say, gentle as a dog, but also uh, being um, firm in terms of uh, meeting out the appropriate consequences. I think, first of all, my experience, first of all, uh, you must stick to what your values are. You are the one that will determine whether you will allow the environment change you or whether you will change the environment. And so remember I said something that in matters of principles, be solid as a rock, uh, in matters of uh, style change. Um, I have been fortunate over the years to come in contact and adopt a particular leadership style. But that leadership style has opened me up many times to being misunderstood. It has opened me many times to being taken for granted um, I've almost sometimes wanted to change who I am, but I keep reaffirming to myself that I will not. And so 
you need to then realize that um, uh, providing consequences for actions that people take does not necessarily mean that you are not gentle. So you need to reassure. So it's a long process. You need to reassure, keep reassuring the people that your ultimate desire is for their good. Keep reassuring them, number one. Number two, keep letting them know what the standards are. And then number three, give them enough long rope that at the end of the day, when you act, if they are truthful to themselves, they will know that you have given them a long rope. But I cannot guarantee that they will agree with you because in, on the immediate, but I've seen situations of people who are disagreed with a particular uh, step that I took in uh, meeting out consequences, uh, five years, six years, 10 years down the line, they come back and they say to me, uh, it was God that um, allowed you to take that step. So be true to yourself. That's what I would say. Be true to yourself and then remember that they are, they are God's people. So be gentle, but also remember that God himself is also a God who uh, lets people have the consequences of their action. So I do not, it's a paradox you need to hold, uh, like I said, uh, juggle both. And one is not, is not to be let down for the other. All right, thank you, sir. I'm going to allow Abia Yuwa Fashikbe to speak. Abia Yuwa, you have the floor. Uh, Abia Yuwa Fashikbe, I'd like you to ask your question. Maybe you can unmute yourself. Abia Yuwa Fashikbe, are you there? I'm trying to unmute you, but it's not allowing me. So can you unmute yourself? I'm trying to do the same. I'm trying to network, sir. Okay, so go, go, go ahead. Now you've unmuted. Go ahead. Actually, I don't, I'm just enjoying the message, sir. I actually, I don't have questions, sir. Because you raised your hand. All right, thank you. Okay, so... Um, Adeola, uh, Adeolu, Adeleye. Can I ask that people should type their questions because it might take a while if I'm going to allow everybody to be speaking. Somebody says, my question is this, how do you monitor the performance of the people that you have to lead? How do you monitor the performance of the people that you have to lead? Uh, after that, I would allow Pastor Cole to ask his question. Go ahead, sir. Okay. After you take this one. So that's 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 rather that's uh, really rather a, a broad question. So first of all, depending on the organization that you 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 are, if it's in the church, if it's in the business, there are performance standards. So there are performance standards. I give for example. Uh, so they say to us in the church, plant five parishes. It's straightforward to plant five parishes. But you also put the standard. The parishes must have toilets, must have this, must have that. So you set the standard. Without standards, you can't you can measure. So what, what, you, what you cannot measure, you cannot improve. So there must be measurement standards. So that's the first thing. If you set the measurement standards in place, then you can monitor. So the problem usually of, of not being able to monitor performance is that there are no standards. And so what you have not set a standard for, you cannot in in real conscience, blame somebody for. So if you've not told the person that the parish he needs to set up has to have toilet, he, maybe the environment where he came from, no toilets are necessary for, for uh, uh, churches. I'm just giving this as a wide example. So uh, it's important you set the standards. If the organization hasn't set the standards, you also let the people know what the performance standards are up front. And once the performance standards are set, then you as the leader will collect data and collection of data sometimes would mean that you, uh, you go out there yourself or you find a feedback, a feed, a feedback um, um, process in which you collect data that will help you assess the performance. So that's the general way in which I would like to answer that. Okay, thank you. Pastor Cole, are you still there so you can ask your question? Uh, no, I'm, I'm, writing, I'm writing it already. I just want to appreciate you guys. Pastor Adopolo, okay. this was a wonderful thing you have done for us. Oh, and Pastor Sudi, Pastor Sudi, you can't give us nothing. You can't give us anything less than what you are giving us anyway. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you, you very much, sir. Thank, Thank you, you so sir. Much. Thank you yes, very sir. much, sir. 
All right, uh, people are asking for the soft copy of your presentation, the slide. I've told them it's not in my place to say yes or no. <laughs> okay. So, um, okay, so have they all registered with you? Yes, yes, yes. Okay, so those who have registered, well, freely I have received, freely I will give. All right, thank you, sir. Now, uh, somebody's asking, talking about mindset shift, can you please expand more on solving problems to holding the container for paradoxes and tension in the system? Can you please expand more on solving problems to holding the container for paradoxes and tension in the system? Okay, so let, let me give an example. When you, are, when you are in the mindset of problem solving, it becomes a question of either or. So a mindset of problem solving is either or. So I gave the example for churches, for example. So you are asked, I've, I've seen people very worried about the directive. So I'll use that and I'll use other, maybe a similar business uh, um, example. So you are asked to, to plant many more parishes. And for you to plant many more parishes, you have to transfer people to those parishes to lead them. And transferring those parishes mean that the numbers in your parish will deplete. But at the same time, you, you also have a, a, a paradoxical requirement. A paradox is something that is, that, is, that is opposite to what you're experiencing. A paradox that says that you should build bigger parishes, parishes of, of larger numbers. So how do you do that? How do you build larger parishes and at the same time you are planting uh, churches? So that's a dilemma that people have often fallen into. And they, it's a complex issue for them. It's an issue that continues to, to trouble them. And so they, they remain stuck in that process of saying, which one must we do? And I'm saying that you can hold those, hold it as a container. A container means a vessel in which you hold both and then invite dialogue from your people to say, how can we achieve this too? So it's holding the container of paradox and not necessarily beginning to problem solve. So you find ways of how can we plant parishes and how can we grow. The business environment, the business example that I said is, if, if a company sets as its goal for this year and says, uh, we, every company today is, is trying to uh, reduce costs. So we're all in a regime of cost, cost uh, they call it different names, cost management, cost reduction, um, and so on, efficiency. But at the same time, they're also talking about improving quality. And ordinary wisdom, ordinary wisdom detects that when you reduce cost to uh, below a certain level, quality suffers. So how do you hold the, the two paradox of improving quality and at the same time lowering cost? So that comes not by trying to solve the problem, a mindset of problem solving, which will, which will push you towards one of the options. But it's to hold conversations with your people to say, this is our goal. And in the midst of that conversation, great ideas will come. There is a concept um, called generative dialogue. What that means is that we must learn to hold dialogue as different from uh, discussion. Now, I know I'm going into very complex issues. Dialogues help to generate options. But sometimes, ordinary discussions focus on problem solving. I've had, I've had conversations with people sometimes and they are, they are very frustrated. I remember deliberately um, a member of, of my church and we were having a conversation as to I uh, wanted to install some blinds and there were two options. And so I said, which do you prefer? He said, I prefer it. I said, why? He said, because I said, so did God uh, give you a revelation that it must be this? He said, no, pastor, this, this is I said, so what if it's this? He was getting a bit confused and, and, and he was getting a bit... Um, frustrated with my approach until I had to tell you know what what I'm doing is challenging your mindset your assumption that it has to be so why don't we look at this other option so that's the kind of conversation we need to have sometimes where we challenge our mindset our assumptions and then we might come up with something richer all right thank you very much sir uh, another one says pastor Sunday in the course of his presentation did encourage leaders to be ready to delegate authority to others are there instances or roles considered so sensitive that the leader should not delegate? A leader should not delegate the issue of casting vision. That's your role. Okay. Um, a leader should, 
should sometimes, 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 if everyone else is backing off in um, communicating bad news, you should take the responsibility of communicating bad news. Um, I remember many years ago as a pastor, uh, we had just finished. So this is just an ordinary example. You take the lead when it's not comfortable. We, we had just finished the, the service for, for a lady who passed on. And every, virtually every minister was giving me the excuse, oh, I'm going, I'm going. And I would have to go and bury the person in the, in the cemetery. And I was left alone. So I couldn't delegate that. I had to call my administrator and then say, well, you are my administrator. You don't have the luxury of taking permission. You are going to go with me. And so two of us went and we did that. So uh, in such circumstances of, of um, a rather difficult situation, you take the lead. In casting vision, you don't delegate. And um, there are some very sensitive uh, situations that, d does not, that do not come to my mind now that uh, I cannot. But I'm just giving a framework, casting vision, um, uh, communicating difficult situations, uh, and sometimes even meeting our consequences, you may have to take the lead in those circumstances, depending on your level in the organization and depending on the people and the context. All right. Praise God. Another one says, um, um, it says here, uh, assuming a leader who is ready and prepared to follow their above principles, but have, but have a set of followers that are, that are sharing in your vision, Followers who refuse to go along your said it's not clear to me. I'll, I'll go to another one because of time. The question is not clear, so I won't bother. It says good day. Followers who are not ready to share in your vision. Yes, how do you, that's what it's asking. Well, you spend time, that's the frustrating aspect, so you have to spend time. So for those of us who are uh, Christians and pastors, uh, one of the parts that I didn't talk about in this is there is the God aspect where you pray. And, and you you ask God to intervene in certain situations. So, but there's a waiting time. So you spend time to to pray and soften the hearts of the people. You spend time to cast and recast your vision, um, and perhaps they will do so. I would I would leave that question with one statement, which is very profound. I don't know if if I would make that statement. I was watching a movie, and um, uh, a soldier. Uh, had refused to follow the instructions of his commanding officer, and he was uh, he was to be punished, and maybe they meted out a very slight punishment, and so he came back to the leader and said, um, "I'm sorry for what I did." After he came to his senses, um, I don't know if you will accept me back into your team and all that. The leader said to him, "Well, um, I, I will accept you back. Uh, my mindset is this: that you failed to." Um, obey others means I have not trained you well. If I had trained you well, you would know that it is not in your place to disobey others. So he took the responsibility upon himself that he didn't train him well. So as leaders, uh, it's not an easy responsibility to take, but you keep doing what you can do until there's a gradual shift. We must not give up. We must not um, uh, chicken out. Okay, it says, um, when you are working with, with an organization, that so much fear failure, but embrace success all the time. In fact, will distance from you if you fail, why you take risks. How can we implement these success imperatives as a leader? Where will your confidence come from? My, 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 view, my view is this. Let me share something, uh, because it's always, it's always um, very easy to shift the responsibility to, to the system, to the to the higher levels of leadership. But all of us that are leaders have our domain, just like a kingdom has a king operating a domain. A leader has a domain, even if it's one person that is your leadership. So I remember years ago, I was pastoring in a particular branch and I was complaining about things that were going on and about. And I remember that, I would say this clearly, God used a particular framework that I used to teach people to speak to me. And that framework is what is called the circle, circle of concern, circle of concern rather, and circle of, um, of um, influence. Influ what that means is that there are, there are things that you can influence, even if it's one person. There are many things that are in your circle of concern, things you are concerned about that you can do nothing. 
So some of these things that have been said by this uh, person who has the question and the circle of concern. So the Lord spoke to me and said, look, you are focusing on what is in your circle of concern about what other people are doing and what is going wrong. Have you finished acting in your own circle of influence? The church where you are pastoring, have you finished addressing the issues there? And that was the day I stopped whining. Of course, I still look at what is going wrong, but I look at what I am not doing or doing in my circle of influence. So I said to that person, focus on your circle of influence. And the good thing about circle of influence is that the more you work on your circle of influence, the more your circle of influence improves or increases. And then ultimately, what you were concerned about, you suddenly realize that you have some influence over it. All right, so if you want, if you want to read up about this, read up the whole concept of circle of influence and circle of concern. Start with what you can influence in your little domain. You can fail in your little domain. I'm not encouraging that people will take very um, risky um, um, approaches that will destroy the organization. I'm talking about measured risk, calculated risk, that the price of failure will not destroy the organization. So that's what I'm saying. So I'm not asking you to go all out and do something that will topple the organization because if you do that, you are putting the whole organization at risk. So take those measured risks, take little, little risks that nobody will hear about and you know you fail, you fail to yourself and you fail to the people that are in your immediate environment. And when you succeed, one success leads you to be courageous to follow another. So I would answer that with that simple analogy of circle of influence and circle of concern. Okay, somebody else says, sir, please, how do you manage leaders who are very domineering, dictative, and you have tried all means to understand them, but you cannot, and no matter how you try to give ideas, his or her own is the final. Okay, so I have worked, I have worked under leaders that are so, but you must, first of all, again, you are a leader who works, who has leadership responsibility over people. So what you complain about, don't do it to others. That's the first thing I need to say. So if you are under a leader who is dictatorial, who is uh, whatever, you make sure that you are not doing that. So that's the first thing. And then accept the fact that this person is the leader. Accept the fact, like, um, I think it was Chief Obas and that said it once, that your role is to advise. You are an advisor. So when you advise and the leader refuses to take your advice, don't take it personal. I think that's usually the problem that we have. When we give advice and the leader says, I don't need your advice, we take it personal. No, it's an advice. Okay, leave it. If you keep giving good advice, many of those leaders are not fools. Sometimes if they see that what they did failed and your advice would have worked, over time they will come to respect you. I've seen such leaders. They will come to respect you. So my point is this, uh, whoever wrote that, uh, keep providing the, the advice. I will share very quickly a story. This is in a business environment. Many years ago, I worked in a consulting firm and um, the new MD took over a uh, bank and myself and my boss, we went to see the MD to ask what can we do uh, for them consulting wise. And as we were going, we saw the head of IT. He was, he, I think he was coming back late from lunch and we, we greeted him and went. And then we went to the new MD's office. And that head of IT had always been complaining about the outgone MD. Uh, that he didn't, doesn't give me any, doesn't allow me to do my things. And so he took on what is called a sit-down look approach. Unfortunately, this new MD came in and he was talking with us. And he said, you know what, I need help. One of the areas I need to, first of all, uh, re-engineer is my IT department. They are not giving me value. So here you see the dilemma. The IT manager is not uh, being productive, is not giving advice any longer because he felt his advice was not being taken. And the new MD is feeling that the IT manager has not been productive and so on and so forth. So if you stop giving advice, if you stop showing what is the right way because uh, somebody is not answering you, then you lose, first of all, your own personal value begins to diminish, number one. Number two, you lose your confidence. When that leader leaves, no leader will be over you forever. No leader. When the leader leaves and a new one comes, you will find it difficult to cope. So stay true to yourself and um, continue. Remember that the leader is a human being. That's what we forget. That leader is a human being. 
Maybe he has experience of the past that has made him not to listen to people. He has his own fears. He has his own insecurities. Let's understand that and then let's stay true and remember that our role is to help the leader succeed. Thank you, sir. Um, another one says, um, since leaders see things based on who they are, what practical actions can church leaders take to change who they are? I, I always try to, again, personalize this and know, you know, when you're preaching a sermon, you don't, you don't, um, you don't um, distribute the things. So rather I'll say, what practical steps can I take to change how I see things? So I need to, to, to look at what somebody has said. I give an example. Sometimes uh, my, my, uh, someone close to me tells me something, and I may not agree with that thing, but in the quietness of my heart at some point in time, I review it. And I say, well, if there's no harm in this, why don't we try it? And then I go on and try it. Okay, so sometimes you can practice by, by doing things that are contrary to your normal step, your normal approach, uh, especially in cases where it is low risk. Let me give you an example. I'm not saying that paradigms are bad. I'm not saying the way we see things are bad. The way we see things are what we call coping mechanism. The assumptions we have about people are what has what uh, enabled us to cope with life. That's good. But if you are going to uh, make progress, you have to challenge those assumptions. So. If, for example, you see somebody that you have had an assumption about, oh, he can't do well, give him an opportunity, he may just, challenge, he may just surprise you. Give him an opportunity, help him to succeed, and if he still fails to succeed, you know you have done your best. So in summarizing it, a way to um, practically do this is to sometimes leave your zone of comfort, okay? Have you ever been driving in a particular direction every day you leave home, you drive in a particular uh, direction. Apart from the fact that it's a security risk, you find that it is, uh, it is, it is something that you, be, you, you lose the opportunity to, to see other sites. I remember one year I was transferred from one church to another. The, the very Sunday I was going to the new church, I found myself driving in the same direction that as if I was going to the old church. It was very interesting. I had to ask myself, oh boy, where are you going to? So you need to change your, just deliberately, do you see it? in a particular place all the time, try and change where you sit. Those little things. Do you um, give the same person um, assignment all the time? Try and change and, and find out. Of course, putting checks and balances in place. So you challenge the way you see things, and I'm referring to, the, to, the, to all of us as individuals. And hopefully if we, if we challenge ourselves, then we will be able to then challenge our leaders to say, why don't you see it this way? Okay, you can't give what you don't have. You can't be dogmatic, and then you are telling your leader not to be dogmatic. All right, thank you very much, sir. Somebody else says, how can you lead a generation that is only money-oriented and not willing to learn? Very good question. That's part of the complexity that we are talking about. I was having a conversation with a young one, a young person in my family the other day. And that's to do with, with, their, with their values and values. And I was arguing about a particular point. He said, Daddy, you don't know what the younger ones believe. And it's true. They are, sometimes you want to open their heads and find out what is inside. And so the, what I would suggest to you, Sir Ma, is the fact that there are basic value systems. So depending on the context, if it's in the church environment, there are values that remain time-tested, okay? And so those values are values that you will continue to teach, okay? Not, don't be weary in teaching them. Um, there was a time many years ago, I sat down and asked myself some things that I was teaching. Is it having the impact? And God surprised me by by letting me see and hear about people that those things were making impact on. So don't give up. You need to teach it. And <clears throat> things, changes don't happen in an instance. Changes don't happen. So be clear about the values you are propagating that is contrary to that mindset and let them see the hollowness of that mindset. Uh, the issue is not money. Money is not the problem. The, 
I don't think the scripture says money is the root of all evil. It says the, the love of money. So uh, I think we need to contextualize it and let them know that money is not the problem, but it's the love of money. It's a desperate love and pursuit of money. And let them know also the fact that uh, the end result of such desperate love. So in summary, keep teaching, keep propagating a concise vision of where you would rather see them than the uh, pursuit of money. Okay, thank you, sir. Um, a few more, and then we'll release you. Um, it says you yes. spoke about enabling others to act. In a situation yes. where you have people who are not ready to make things work effectively, how do you encourage them? Very good question. Um, if, you, if you were in an environment where you can, um, you can hire and fire, so to say, uh, you can afford to, to choose your team, you can afford to coach them, you can afford to um, uh, do all the things you need to do. And if they fail to change, then you move them somewhere else or you tell them that this organization uh, is probably not a fit for you. It's not that they are useless, probably the organization is not a fit after phases of, um, of conversation. Part of this can work. I'm faced with, at various levels with that, um, with that, with that issue. And part of it is constant dialogue, uh, finding um, options for consequences. So there's also the issue of, um, managing consequences, that could be a topic for another conversation. Uh, managing uh, consequences in a non-profit um, environment like ours. So uh, use of, uh, of uh, the stick and the carrot and letting them know ultimately what, what, what will become their lot. But at the end of the day, if you've tried uh, your best, Sometimes it may be profitable to move some of those people to a different assignment uh, where they may be more productive, okay, and, and leave them there. If they are not productive right. in a particular assignment, look for other ways they will be productive. So it's a never-ending circle, I must, I must let you know. Uh, like we've seen uh, in the complex um, example we gave, there's no one straight answer. You're going to keep trying different different approaches, and that's why it's good as leaders that we read, and that we we also learn from other sources. All right, <coughs> thank you, thank you very much, sir. Um, there are a few other questions, but we won't be able to take them. I really want us to honor the um, our obligations to end by 1:30. Want to thank you so very much, sir. The Lord will bless you. Um, it's been a privilege and a pleasure to have you. Um, you've promised us the slides and the recording will be available, I'm sure, before the end of today. Usually, I would, for those who want the recording, if you send an email, I would direct you to the link so you can download it yourself. It will be on till about midday tomorrow because my space on the cloud cannot take back to back. So if you want to download, you must download between when I send the link to you and midday tomorrow. So thank you very much, sir. Um, it's, been a, it's been a pleasure having you. Uh, so I would just, um, I would, um, so you can, thank you so very much. God bless you.